on our, our panel this afternoon, I will talk a bit about the history of sexual expression prior to the enactment of the First Amendment. Uh, Martin Reddish, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, will speak about uh, the evolution of uh, obscenity doctrine under the First Amendment in American law. And Amy Adler will speak on uh, a variety of modern man manifestations of the issue of regulation of sexual expression. Marty Reddish is the Lewis and Harriet Ansel Professor of Law and Public Policy here at Northwestern University. His scholarship focuses on freedom of expression, constitutional law, civil procedure, and federal courts. He is the author or co-author of more than 80 articles and 15 books, including The Logic of Persecution, Free Expression, and The McCarthy Era. A recent study listed Marty as the 16th most cited legal professor uh, most, most cited legal scholar of all time, and he's been recognized repeatedly as among the most highly cited researchers worldwide. Amy Adler is the Emily Kempen Professor of Law at New York University. Her research interests include free speech, gender and sexuality, feminist theory, and law culture and the humanities. Professor Adler's recent publications include Child Pornography in the Columbia Journal of Law and Gender, Age of Innocence in Modern Art and Culture, and Against Moral Rights in, in the California Law Review. Amy is now working on an article, The First Amendment and the Second Commandment, for the Law and Culture uh, Visual Studies. So to begin, we need two simple definitions. Pornography is material that excites sexual arousal. Obscenity is pornography that is made illegal because of its sexual content. Most Americans seem to believe that pornography is a relatively recent phenomenon and that laws against obscenity are deeply rooted in our Western history. Putting aside the apparent contradiction in those two beliefs, I want to talk this afternoon about the origins of the law of obscenity in an effort to show that both of those beliefs are inaccurate. So we begin in the beginning. In ancient times, sexual explicitness in drama, poetry, art, and sculpture was not regulated by the state. In 3000 BC, the Sumerians accepted sex as a natural part of life. Terracottas from that era graphically depict intercourse, anal intercourse, prostitution, and same-sex sex. And Sumerian literature candidly portrayed human love as intimately connected to sexual pleasure. Greece and Rome punished seditious, blasphemous, and heretical expression, but they did not generally regulate expression on grounds of obscenity. Greek artists depicted explicit scenes of intercourse, anal intercourse, masturbation, and fellatio on vases and terracottas, and Greek drama was often quite bawdy. Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides all dealt candidly with same-sex sex, and Aristophanes portrayed sexuality in all of its many forms. The very idea of censoring art, theater, song, or literature because it was improperly sexual would have seemed quite bizarre to the Greeks. Roman poetry and drama were similarly filled with sexual innuendo, eroticism, and sensuality. Rome's most famous poets spoke candidly of sexual matters. Ovid, for example, wrote playfully and quite explicitly about homosexuality, impotence, menage a trois, and adultery. His art of love has aptly been described as a sophisticated manual of hedonism, designed to teach the art of enjoying a woman's body as fully and as delightfully as possible. After Christianity became the dominant religion, censorship on religious grounds became much more prevalent. But for 1,500 years, through the end of the Middle Ages, neither the church nor the state censored sexual expression because it was thought to be obscene. Although the church changed fundamentally the prevailing view of sex from something wholesome to something sinful, it did not attempt to suppress erotic expression. The most important form of sexual literature in the Middle Ages was the fableau, a story form similar to the fable, usually in verse, often dealing with sex. Such tales were told over and over again in taverns, around campfires, and in castles. The cast of characters typically, typically included lusty monks, gullible husbands, and duplicitous wives, all of whom acted with flagrant disregard for the moral implications of their acts. The fableaux were often joyously pornographic. 
Boccaccio's The Decameron and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales were also both quite bawdy. The Decameron comprises a total of 100 witty, tragic, heroic, and often quite licentious tales of the human condition. Roughly a third of the stories are erotic in nature, dealing with such situations as adultery, incest, menage a trois, sodomy, mistaken identity, homosexuality, masturbation, and, which was common in that era, the sexual misadventures of priests and nuns. In the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer turned both the French Fableau and the Decameron to his own purposes. In the Merchant's Tale, for example, two lovers have intercourse in a pear tree while the woman's husband stands innocently below. And in the Reeves tale, two Cambridge students end up swiving a mother and daughter in the same room. Although the Cameron and the Canterbury tales were both later attacked for their sexual passages, this was not an issue in the 15th century. A key turning point in the history of literary pornography was Gutenberg's invention of the printing press in 1428, which for the first time made it possible to distribute written works among the general population readily as the power of publication began to be felt by those in authority, the English crown took steps to rein it in. In 1557, the Stationers' Company was incorporated for the protection of readers of books. The Royal Charter declared it unlawful for any person to set up a printing press without a license, and it empowered the company to imprison any person who published without its authority. But the state had no interest in obscenity. It directed its attention exclusively against sedition, blasphemy, and heresy. Indeed, the English language did not even have a word for inappropriate sexual expression until the 16th century. And even then, the word bawdry did not have a negative connotation. Words like pornography and obscenity did not yet exist. The introduction of Pietro Aretino's writings into England in the late 16th century revolutionized English pornography. An Italian poet and satirist, Aretino's work, particularly his use of graphic, sexually explicit dialogues between an older, experienced woman and a younger, innocent one, became the model for the 17th century pornographic prose. Because it's important to understand what I mean by graphic, sexually explicit expression, here's a representative excerpt from one of Aretino's sonnets. Stick your finger up my ass, old man. Thrust cock in a little more. Lift up my leg, maneuver well. Now pound with all inhibitions gone. If you don't like the cunt, try the back way. A real man has to be a buggerer. Even the introduction of Aretino's writings did not call forth any effort to, to suppress such speech until the Puritans began demanding a stricter set of sexual standards. In 1580, William Lambert drafted a bill to restrain licentious publications. Lambert argued that such publications triggered the high displeasure of God. The bill reflected the growing discomfort of moralists with the rapid spread of erotic material, but it was not enacted. It was not until 1708 that England experienced what we today might describe as its first obscenity prosecution. James Reed, a printer, was charged with publishing The Fifteen Plagues of a Maidenhead, a lengthy poem that described the frustration of a maiden who was desperate to lose her virginity. To understand this excerpt, it's useful to know that an anchorite was a mystic who chose to live a totally isolated and ascetic life. I quote from one passage. Oh, stroke my breast, those mountains of delight. Your very touch would fire an anchorite. Next, let your palm a little stray and dip thy fingers in the Milky Way. Then having raised me, let me gently fall. Love's trumpets found, so mortal have it all. Poor prisoners may, I see, have mercy shown, and shipwrecked men may sometimes have the luck to see their dismal tempests overblown. But I, poor virgin, shall never be fucked. <clears throat> the Queen's Bench Court found that this publication created no offense at common law. As the court explained, this is for printing bawdy stuff. It is stuff not fit to be mentioned publicly, but there is no law to punish it. It tends to the corruption of good manners, perhaps, but that is not sufficient for us to punish. The court dismissed the indictment, holding that the writing of such a book is not indictable by law, but is punishable only in the spiritual court. English law first punished an obscene publication in 1727 in the case of King versus Curl. The dispute involved Edward Curl, one of the most notorious rascals of his day. Curl published Venus in the Cloister, or The Nun in Her Smock, 
an English translation of a French anti-Catholic tract. The story begins with the scene of voyeurism as the nun Angelica spies through a keyhole as Sister Agnes masturbates. Later, Angelica watches as her own lover, a monk, has sex with another man. More than 50 sex aids are used in the convent by everyone from the abbess to the youngest nun. Most of the story is in the form of a sexually explicit dialogue among the sisters. In one scene, for example, Sister Angelica introduces the innocent Sister Agnes to sexual pleasure. After positioning Agnes naked on her hands and knees and spanking her, Angelica exclaims, Oh, let me look at you. Do you know that this portion of you is growing ever more lovely? A certain fire animates it. I see everything I desire. I'm overjoyed with it. I have in front of me a little labyrinth of coral and alabaster, and in its windings my finger do their duty and delight. By Venus, it is narrow, erect, well-placed, brisk, ticklish, and passionate. It moves by itself. Already I feel there a soft wetness. Several months after he published Venus in the Cloister, Curl was indicted. His counsel argued that the Reed decision, the one I mentioned a moment ago, had definitively established that the publication of a pornographic work was not punishable. The three justices were divided. Justice Fortescue voted to reaffirm the Reed decision, concluding that although the publication of Venus in the Cloister is a great offense to the popular uh, mind, there is no law by which it can be punished. Justice Reynolds disagreed. He conceded that there may be many instances where acts of immorality are of a spiritual cognizance only, but he argued that this was not one of them. Justice Probin, who cast a deciding vote, opined that Curl's publication was punishable as an offense against the peace, intending to weaken the bonds of civil society, virtue, and morality. As punishment, the court imposed a modest fine. Despite a proliferation of sexual explicit writings and the precedent of Curl's case, obscenity prosecutions remained extremely rare in 18th century England. The Toast, a satirical work attributed to William King, published in 1736, has aptly been described as one of the most obscene works ever printed. Although it contained detailed descriptions of the sexual adventures of a hermaphrodite, you can imagine all of the possibilities, <laughs> it was not prosecuted. Indeed, English readers in the 18th century had ready access not only to pornographic works of fiction, but also to a constant stream of sexually explicit poems, whore catalogs, prints, and anti-Catholic and anti-government tracts. Although pornography initially served primarily as a form of entertainment and sexual stimulation, during the Enlightenment it gradually became an important vehicle of protest against the authority of church and state, and finally against middle-class morality. Spurred by a growing interest in previously unexplored issues of, sexual, uh, of, of human sexuality, as well as the opportunity to make a fast buck, English writers produced a slew of often quite salacious sex guides that dealt with such issues as masturbation, dildos, flagellation, menage a trois, how to enlarge one's pudenda, and how to lengthen one's yard, <laughs> most of which were painful. <clears throat> As illustrated by Venus in the Cloister, many pornographic works in this era were barely disguised anti-Catholic tracts. Typically set, set in monasteries or convents, these writings depicted the real or imagined sexual adventures of monks and nuns. The Pope as a lecher was a frequent theme in anti-Catholic erotica, as illustrated by the anonymously authored A Full and True Account of a Dreaded Fire that Lately Broke Out in the Pope's Breaches which was published in 1713 and tells of a beautiful London courtesan who attracts the Pope's interest. In one scene, the Pope attempts to bugger the courtesan, explaining that he seldom had of late used his key to open foregate. When she inserts his key in her other keyhole, the Pope cries out, amazed, the key goes in most wondrous easy. What is the keyhole, broke or greasy? Pornography was also used to pillory the nobility. In 1771, a French expatriate living in London published a work that skewered Louis XV and his mistress, Madame du Barry, chronicling in exquisite detail her alleged lesbian relationships with her maids, her career as a prostitute, and her seduction by a monk. One of the most important literary developments in the mid-18th century was, of course, the appearance of the novel. Early novels such as Moll Flanders, Clarissa, The Adventures of Roderick Ransom, Tom Jones, and Tristram Shandy all dealt playfully with such themes as seduction, adultery, voyeurism, incest, and fornication. 
The illustrations for these novels often emphasize the erotic facets of the work. By the mid-18th century, one critic could complain that this new literary form was marked by extreme indecency, an undue emphasis on fornic fornication and adultery. The increasing popularity of sexuality in the novel coincided with a growing demand for realism, and the Enlightenment's challenge to traditional Christian beliefs about sex. The foremost example of a mid-18th century uh, pornographic work was John Cleland's Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, which came to be known by the name of its heroine, Fanny Hill. First published in England in 1748, Memoirs employs the familiar plot of the innocent country girl who comes to London and enjoys a series of amorous adventures, which in Fanny's case involved masturbation, lesbianism, fetishism, group sex, sadomasochism, and flagellation. Literary historians speculate that Cleveland made a bet with his friends that he could write the dirtiest book in the English language without using a single dirty word. <laughs> in one scene, typical, Fanny describes a moment of masturbation. I stole my hand up my petticoat and with fingers all on fire seized and yet more inflamed at center of all my senses. My heart palpitated as I twisted my thighs, squeezed and compressed the lips of that virgin slit and brought on at last the critical ecstasy, the melting flow into which nature, spent with excess of pleasure, dissolves and dies away. Cleland was arraigned before the Privy Council for writing an obscene book. He pleaded poverty as an excuse. <laughs> Reflecting the prevailing attitude of the time, the president of the council resolved the prosecution by awarding Cleland a pension of 100 pounds a year on condition that he not repeat the events. <laughs> Memoirs went on to become the most successful pornographic work of the 18th century, but unfortunately for Cleland, he had sold the copyright to a publisher for a mere 20 pounds. Enlightenment thinkers of the 17th and 18th centuries contested many aspects of Christianity. They especially decried Christian sexual doctrines as arbitrary restrictions imposed by man in his ignorance and insisted that sexual pleasure was presumptively good rather than sinful. They sought to reassert the innocence of sexuality and to celebrate it as an integral and praiseworthy part of man's nature. Diderot, for example, contrasted what he regarded as the pure, natural, and open sexuality of the Tahitians with what he saw as the rigid, narrow-mindedness of Christian sexual morality. To the Tahitians, the newly arrived Christians appeared superstitious and hypocritical. In Diderot's view, it was not the serpent who brought sin, shame, and guilt to Tahiti, but Christianity. On the other hand, Enlightenment thinkers did not advocate unrestrained sexual liberty. Rather, they attempted to redefine exceptional sexual conduct by seeking rational rules to guide it. The widespread writing about sex in this era by the philosophers led to a sort of downward osmosis through which an upper-class philosophy gradually was absorbed by the larger culture. As the English historian Peter Wagner has observed, the Age of Enlightenment might properly be termed the Age of Eros. By the 1770s, sexually titillating novels following the example of memoirs had become increasingly popular, and sexually explicit prints and sex manuals were readily available in London shops. Sex aids were also routinely imported from abroad, and men of some means could even order life-size dolls for their sexual enjoyment. So we think that happened recently. Nope. <laughs> Sex therapy also became popular. Its most famous exponent was James Grant, who lectured to large crowds about the invigorating pro properties of ha happy sexuality. Among the techniques that he advocated was the use of pornography to arouse the passions. All of this was legal. Enlightenment sexuality did, however, have limits. Most notably, 18th century attitudes toward female sexuality were ambivalent. On the one hand, Enlightenment thinkers rejected the traditional Christian belief that women were carnal temp temptresses. On the other hand, Enlightenment era men generally did not treat women or their sexuality with equal respect. A wife was expected to be a virgin on her wedding night and faithful thereafter. A husband was expected to have had considerable sexual experience before marriage, and his wife was expected thereafter to overlook his infidelities. Women who were openly sexual tended to be denigrated as wantons, and although in theory the Enlightenment accepted women as intelligent and rational creatures, misogyny was deeply ingrained in Western culture. More to my point, though, English law in this era yielded nothing conclusive about the concept of obscenity. 
There was no agreed upon definition of the term, no rationale for its regulation, and only very rare and sporadic skirmishes over the issue. Throughout this era, government officials made no serious effort to curb the proliferation of pornography. By the 1780s, when the United States was contemplating its constitution, London was awash in all sorts of sexually explicit material. At this critical moment in American history, English law was largely silent on the issue of obscenity. As indeed was American law. Indeed, the first obscenity prosecution in the United States did not occur until 1815, at the height of the religious fervor of the Second Great Awakening, a quarter of a century after the United States had enacted the First Amendment. For all practical purposes, then, the legal concept of obscenity is the brainchild of the 19th century. Pornography was rampant in 18th century Britain and in 18th century America, and constitutional originalists have no historical basis for attempting to trace obscenity doctrine to the free ruling world of pre 19th century literature. Here in the 21st century, we've clearly moved well beyond the 19th century, but it's not at all clear that we've yet got ourselves back to the 18th. Thank you very much. As you can see from Jeff's talk, First Amendment scholars enjoy their work. Uh, <laughs> I was worried about some things I was going to quote today, but... <laughs> Post-adoption of the Constitution, it is quite clear that obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment. The debate has never been whether obscenity should be protected or shouldn't be protected. The debate, rather, has been about what is obscenity. How do we characterize it? How do we define it? My position is that the exclusion of obscenity from the First Amendment is inconsistent with fundamental foundational notions of free speech theory and indeed of liberal democratic theory. If, if a Martian who knew everything about First Amendment theory but had never heard of obscenity came down here and found out what we do with obscenity, he, she, or it would say, what the heck? Because it is so blatantly inconsistent with the fundamental premises of democratic theory and free expression. Let me give you a, a quick reader's digest of First Amendment theory. There are, there are roughly, and I'm oversimplifying here, two lines of, of theoretical foundation for the First Amendment. One is a communitarian notion and one is uh, the liberal individualist notion. But on these key points, the two merge together. The communitarian notion purports to have uh, imposed no value on development of the individual. It is rather the ability of the community to determine for itself what is right, what is true, what is good. And in order to assure the majority's ability to rule, paradoxically, we limit the majority's ability to suppress individuals uh, from speaking. The liberal individualist model associated uh, heavily with Mill and Kant purports to f uh, focus especially on the individual, the growth of the individual's intellectual, personal uh, abilities, his, his or her uniquely human qualities. John Stuart Mill uh, once said that the concept of a benevolent dictator is an oxymoron. Uh, there can be no such thing as a benevolent dictator because once we have a dictator, the, the ability of individuals to develop will disappear and their mental and uniquely human capacities will atrophy. This has led to some fundamental principles of free expression that are applied in every context except obscenity. First is what I refer to as the principle of epistemological humility. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge, how we know things. Epistemological humility posits that whatever we think 
is true or just or right. We have to put it in the flow of history. And in the flow of history, many times things that people thought were true turned out not to be. Uh, excuse me, I, I have to beg your indulgence. I lost my voice this afternoon screaming at the television as Northwestern made a comeback to defeat <laughs> Iowa. And in a bit of trash talking, I should say, they could beat University of Chicago and NYU quite easily. Um, <laughs> the principle of epistemological humility has led to the prohibition on viewpoint regulation. And if there is one element of First Amendment theory that the Supreme Court adheres to throughout its doctrine, it is the prohibition on viewpoint regulation. Government is not allowed to suppress ideas or thoughts because government disagrees with them. So given that, how can we exclude obscenity from the First Amendment? Well, first let's talk about what obscenity is. And there's a long history of, of doctrine going back and forth. Finally, in 1973, in a case called Miller versus California, uh, the Supreme Court came up with the standard. An opinion written by Chief Justice Berger. You may, some of you may remember Chief Justice Berger. He, he looked like he'd been sent over from central casting to play the greatest Chief Justice of all time. <laughs> However, that's where the similarity ended. Um, <laughs> the test that uh, students taking the bar exam have to learn is the following. A, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. When I first began teaching the First Amendment, I looked up the word prurient in the American Heritage Dictionary. The first two definitions were itching and feeling uncomfortable. Um, so I guess obscenity is like the heartbreak of psoriasis. I don't... Um, but that's the first factor. The average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the parent interest. B, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable law. And C, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Now, I should emphasize in my talk today, I am not discussing child pornography, and I'm not talking about obscenity that is thrust on unwilling viewers. That, that's for a different day. But the First Amendment has been excluded from obscenity seen by willing adults when it's been proposed or shown by willing adults. The problem with the obscenity regulation, as can be seen from this test, is what I refer to as the fallacy of the Jewish grandmother syndrome. <laughs> My grandmother used to say to me, I'm cold, go put on a sweater. I, my grandmother had, had many views on constitutional theory. Apparently, uh, the, earlier today, there was a discussion of reproductive rights, which focuses on the issue of when life begins. She always thought life began upon graduation from medical school. But <laughs> it's one theory, um, but I digress. Uh, I would say to her, if you're cold, you go put on a sweater. And that is basically, in a nutshell, what is going on in the area of obscenity regulation. The majority, through a jury, finds that they don't like something. They find it offensive. They find that it appeals to prurient interest. So I can't see it. If you put this in the terms of First Amendment theory, there are three pathologies that are developed. What I call majoritarianism, paternalism, and twilight zone viewpoint regulation. <laughs> first, think about the majoritarianism. The whole premise of the First Amendment is that the majority cannot suppress expression of the individual because they disagree with it. Uh, yet, that's what's going on here. Those who are not asked to see it, and, um, not forced to see it, are telling others that they can't witness it because they find it offensive. Um, the concept of paternalism is also anathema 
to First Amendment theory. The idea that government can prevent people from being exposed to different information, different ideas, because we can't trust what they will do with it. It is only in the most extreme case where the danger of, of criminal conduct is, is imminent that we allow that kind of regulation. Yet that is one of the basic concerns motivating the, uh, the exclusion of obscenity from the scope of the First Amendment, that people will have minds that will degenerate. Finally, what I call twilight zone viewpoint regulation. When obscenity is, is regulated, there is no expression of a particular viewpoint. However, the whole idea of obscenity exists in an ether of a particular assumption of the role of sex in life. To restrict obscenity is basically to um, suppress expression because of a disagreement with that fundamental underlying ether uh, in which obscenity exists. So what are the arguments that justify the exclusion of obscenity? Well, the first one is historical. Justice Brennan, in 1957, said that historically there were um, states pre-Constitution had bans on blasphemy or obscenity. The problem with his analysis is that it proves too much because today blasphemy prohibitions would clearly violate the First Amendment. No one would have any doubt on that basis. If history is so controlling today, then we logically should allow blasphemy regulations, yet we don't. Why then does history support regulation of obscenity? The fact really is we don't know what the framers meant in the First Amendment. The First Amendment was not drafted at the Philadelphia Convention where notes were taken. It, they, they were drafted by Madison one Sunday afternoon while he, while he was watching the Patriots game and, <laughs> and, and drinking a bottle of Sam Adams. <laughs> and he just spins them out on his word processor. One through 10, we don't know what the framers meant. But it really doesn't matter. They gave us the gift of the language of the First Amendment, of the basic ideas, the outer contours of which they couldn't even know. And we are not bound by some, some notions that they had at the time. Did you ever see the way they dressed? Uh, <laughs> the, the second argument is that Obscenity does not contribute to the marketplace of ideas. As um, Justice Stevens, for whom I have great respect, a graduate of this law school, but occasionally his synapses would misfire when it came to the First Amendment, <laughs> once wrote, few of us would march our sons and daughters off to war to preserve the citizens' right to see the movie specified sexual activities exhibited in the theaters of our choice. I don't remember the movie specified sexual activities. It doesn't sound like the kind of title that would attract the kind of crowd they were probably trying to attract. But it seems to me the answer to Justice Stevens is that we send our sons and daughters off to war, if indeed we're going to do that, to protect the right of people to read and see what they want without the government being able to tell them it's worthless or it's bad for them. Uh, another argument that's used is, is often referred to as sexploitation. Um, Chief Justice Warren focused on this point and, and a number of scholars on the political left have, have emphasized this as well. There is, there is a commercial exploitation going on by the, obs the obscenity and pornography industry. Of course, given the internet, a lot of it is done for free these days. People just seem to en en enjoy doing it. But since when does commercial motivation for expression uh, logically exclude the expression from the First Amendment. The First Amendment is not the preserve of Mother Teresa. It never was. Books are sold. Newspapers are sold. Yet no one questions that they have full First Amendment protection. Why then should the commercial motivation of the um, obscenity industry, if we can call it that, make any difference at all? The final argument is one associated with a very famous free speech scholar, 
Fred Schauer, who's now at the University of Virginia. A number of years ago, Fred Schauer argued basically that obscenity isn't speech. It's the equivalent of one of those sex toys that you can buy in some strange places. Let me, let me read you from Professor Schauer's book. A refusal to treat hardcore pornography as speech in the technical sense is grounded in the belief that the prototypical pornographic item shares more of the characteristics of sexual activity than of communication. The pornographic item is a sexual surrogate. It takes pictorial or linguistic form only because some individuals achieve sexual gratification that way. And now I should emphasize, I am still reading from Professor Schauer's book. <laughs> Imagine a person going to a house of prostitution and in accord with his particular sexual pr preferences, requesting that two prostitutes engage in sexual activity with each other while he becomes aroused. Having achieved sexual satisfaction in this manner, he pays his money and leaves, never having touched either of the prostitutes. Or imagine a person who asks that a leather-clad prostitute crack a whip within an inch of his ear. I should, I should tell you, I'm, I'm glad to be able to say Professor Schauer has gone into therapy and he no longer... <laughs> has, I don't know whether he's gone into therapy. These are hardly free speech cases. Despite the fact that eyes and ears are used, these incidents are no more communicative than any other experience with a prostitute. This is physical activity, the lack of physical contact notwithstanding. There are numerous problems with Professor Schauer's analysis. The first is, think of the logical implication of what he's saying. If someone watched a leather-clad prostitute cracking a whip within an inch of his ear and did not find that arousing, then presumably it would be protected. I mean, what a waste. It just... <laughs> um. But secondly, one cannot compartmentalize the cognitive and the emotional reactions to expression. There is theater, there is music, there is art that leaves one tingling physically, literally. Does that mean it's not part of the First Amendment? There is a difference between sexual gratification through direct physical conduct, contact and conduct, and on the one hand, and watching uh, others engage in it on, on the other. It's the same difference as laughing hysterically at a Marx Brothers movie or being tickled. One is protected by the First Amendment, even though it produces um, a non-cognitive impact, and the other isn't, because it skips the part of the brain that involves cognitive thought. Tickling is a direct physical contact that isn't protected. So uh, Professor Schauer's analysis, um, I believe, really misses the point of the First Amendment. I just want to close with a recollection about an event in Chicago that many of you may have remembered about 20 years ago, the Art Institute had an exhibit, I think it was traveling around, called Degenerate Art. And it was ironically titled because none of the art was really degenerate. It was art that the Nazis had removed from museums in every country that they invaded because it just didn't fit with the image that the Nazis wanted to convey. It wasn't by Jews, it wasn't really pornographic, it was just the Nazis' image of art that they were trying to impose on every one of their captured populaces as a form of mind control. And as, as you left the exhibit, they had a multimedia exhibit showing actual films all over you, surrounding you of, of Nazis burning books, and it was a frightening vision. And you know, I didn't know what books they were burning. They might be books that I personally would hate, but the very vision of government burning books is so deeply offensive to the essential premises of, of liberal theory and the dignity of, of the human as a participant in the democratic process that it doesn't matter what books are being burned. And obscenity regulation is the legal equivalent of book burning and therefore deeply offensive to the foundational social contract of liberal thought. Thank you very much.
Okay, you guys are going to get a very bad impression of law professors here because I have to tell you, most law professors are not this much fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is totally wrong. That's not how it usually is at all. Um, I'm going to switch topics in, in a couple of ways to um, a topic that is much less fun, actually. Um, I'm going to talk about child pornography law, not obscenity law. And I'm also going to talk about contemporary pop culture. And um, a couple of things about this switch in topic that I want to draw your attention to. Um, I'm also going to be PowerPointing away. Um, so whereas obscenity law um, is justified, as, as Marty told us quite beautifully, by uh, ill-founded reasons, the rationale behind banning child pornography from protection under the First Amendment is one that, although we might quibble about it as a matter of First Amendment law, at least as a matter of public policy makes a lot of sense. The, the basic idea, and there are multiple rationales that the Supreme Court articulated, but the basic idea is that we have to um, ban child pornography because to create it, a child has to be harmed, and that's why we ban it. And so I think you can see right away that we're in a territory that's much less controversial for us um, and that most of us would probably agree with. The second thing about child pornography law that differs from obscenity law that I want to highlight today is just in terms of its actual importance um, as a matter of cont contemporary censorship. Uh, there are very few contemporary obscenity trials going on. There are some in this country, but it's rare. Child pornography law, on the other hand, is expanding rapidly. And this, this um, statistic is just to give you an idea of how quickly it's accelerating. FBI investigations grew over 2,000% between 1996 and 2005. This is the most active form of government censorship in the country right now. And law enforcement people and prosecutors say they simply can't keep up with the amount of pedophilic material available on the web. So this is, uh, there are tons of cases happening all the time in the lower courts. Um, so, so let me say a word about how I'm going to get to sexting. Here we have this body of law designed to protect children from a horrific crime, the crime of sexual abuse. But a very strange thing has happened. As the law has expanded dramatically, it has um, sometimes grown to govern areas that seem quite far afield from the original reasons that the Supreme Court established child pornography as unprotected by the First Amendment in the first place. And a salient example comes from the recent epidemic of sexting prosecutions, which began in earnest really just in 2009. And these cases have been, uh, there's been a, a ton of them, in which teens are being prosecuted as sex offenders for making child pornography of themselves. In other words, taking pictures of themselves with their cell phones and texting them to their uh, friends or sexual partners. And so now what we've got is a situation where the teen who takes a picture of herself has become a child pornographer. So the question I want to ask is, how did a body of law designed to protect children from sexual abuse come to be leveraged against children themselves? on its fringes. I want to make clear it's leveraged against a lot of uh, people who are actually molesting children. But how did it come to be used against children too? In other words, how did the law come to picture the criminal and the victim as one and the same person, as sometimes occurs in these sexting cases? And so to answer that question, um, I want to do two things. First, I want to give you a, a crash course on the evolution of child pornography law, and particularly its expanding definition. And then I want to talk about pop culture. And I'm going to look at two examples from um, Calvin Klein ads, both of which elicited public ac accusations of child pornography. And my goal is to try to provoke you to think about the complex relationship between censorship of sexual speech and um, contemporary culture and desire for that matter. So, um, and, and hopefully I, I think this might help us get a new take on what's happening with sexting. So let me begin, I mentioned already um, the rationale for prohibiting child pornography, but the Supreme Court first thought about child pornography only in 1982 in a case called New York versus Ferber, um, and that was the beginning of its child pornography jurisprudence in which it basically held there's this stuff that is not protected by the First Amendment. And in terms of the definition of child pornography, 
Um, this is the contemporary definition under federal law, but it's really, it hasn't changed since Ferber. Um, it applies to visual depictions. This is not words, it's just images, photographs really, of a minor engaging in sexually explicit conduct. Who's a minor for federal law? Anyone under the age of 18. And what this means, and this is also relevant for sexting, is that we've got people who are above the age of consent for purposes of having sex who are being prosecuted for taking pictures of themselves having sex because they're not yet 18. People who are 16 and 17 can consent to sex in most states but can't consent to taking pictures of themselves. Um, ooh, my slide is running over a little bit. So I'll have to, luckily I can tell you what it says. Sexually explicit conduct um, has a statutory definition. And it means a few things that's pretty obvious in terms of a minor engaging in sexually explicit conduct, sexual intercourse, um, the slide doesn't show the rest of it, masturbation. But it also includes a category that leaves a lot to interpretation. And that is the lascivious exhibition of genitals. So what's lascivious exhibition of the genitals, and how does that differ from a picture of a baby in a bathtub or a kid on the beach? That's a question that a lot of courts have tried to wrestle with. And um, a test that was developed in 1986 by a district court test has been used by just about every court that's examined this, and asks for six factors in trying to determine whether a picture actually meets the definition of lascivious exhibition of the genitals. Is that, you know, nude picture of a child, child pornography, or is it just cute? And the questions it asks, they're, they're here up on the screen. Um, what's the focal point of the picture? Um, is the setting sexually suggestive? Is the child in inappropriate attire? Is he or she clothed or nude? Is she suggesting sexual coyness or a willingness to engage in um, sexual activity? And as you might imagine, some of these factors are highly manipulable. Um, so for example, on the question of whether a setting is sexually suggestive, uh, a prosecutor argued in, about a few years ago in front of the First Circuit, a picture of a child on a beach is sexually suggestive. Why? Because beaches are sexually suggestive because so many people take honeymoons there. Um, <laughs> the court rejected it, but this is the kind of argument that goes on, and these, these factors can be manipulated quite a lot. Um, is nudity required for something to be child pornography without overt sexual conduct going on in it, just to be lascivious exhibition? The answer is no. Um, in a very controversial Third Circuit case in 1994, United States versus Knox, um, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals held that to be a lascivious display of genitals, the child's genitals did not need to be discernible, and in fact, the child did not need to be nude. So you can see that we're getting into a terrain where we might imagine um, child pornography law, would, it would, its application might be uncertain on the fringes. So then we get to sexting. Um, this modern problem. And according to a study by the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, there have been a couple of studies since finding similar statistics, about 20% of teens aged 13 to 19 have done it. It's very, very common. And it's illegal. Um, and it can mean child pornography, depending on the content of the picture. It can include a wide range of issues, by the way. Sexting can mean different things. It can mean um, someone can be prosecuted for producing child pornography by taking a picture of herself. Possession for receiving a picture and having it on your cell phone. Um, but sometimes it's, it's more sinister. There was an 18-year-old recently, he's a sex offender now, who um, his 16-year-old girlfriend had sent him a picture of herself, and when they broke up, he sent it to his friends. So he is now... Um, a sex offender. So, so there are different, when we say sexting, sexting, we mean different things. But here's a case that, um, a recent case that's gotten a lot of attention. This is a, a case in which, which did involve prosecution against, or, or threatened prosecution against girls for being child pornographers of themselves. And here are the pictures in question. Pictures of provocatively posed 13-year-old girls wearing white opaque bras and another photo of a girl with a towel wrapped around her body just below her waist. Now, um, this, this I, I, my slide is somewhat deceiving. It says it was upheld, the dismissal of the uh, 
basically, the, this was thrown out of court for reasons not having to do with the content of the material, but the court did assume, without opining, that this could be child pornography, pictures of girls in their bras. And I just want to add that a lot of states are looking at this. When I last counted this summer, there were 20 states trying to figure out what to do about sexting. It's, there's so many cases, so many problems in schools. And most states are trying to think of ways to avoid using child pornography law, but still to prosecute kids for engaging in this kind of behavior. So now let me turn to pop culture for a minute and ask some questions. OK, so at the same time we are prosecuting teens for sexting, do you guys, I don't know how many of you have anything to do with pop culture. I'm the low, maybe the lowbrow on this panel. Um, Miley Cyrus is Hannah Montana from Disney. She is the sort of clean Disney product that young girls watch, six-year-old girls watch. Um, this is her sort of new thing. At 17, she's now taken to appearing. She's done a sort of de rigueur lesbian kiss. She's done the pole dancing like a stripper. She's, she's out and about sort of doing very sexual stuff now, this 17-year-old this Disney girl. Um, another prominent teen um, idol, Taylor Mumson. This is taken when she was 16 as one of her milder costumes. Um, also appears on Gossip Girl. This is, this is what um, mainstream teen stars are dressing like while we're prosecuting other teens for pictures of themselves wearing white opaque bras. So it's just, a, I, I think, a moment of cultural confusion. And I might add that it's not just teens. Um, we've got the sexualization of tweens. And this was a video that went viral for reasons that I have to wonder about, but um, eight and nine-year-old girls dancing in a, to Beyonce as all the single ladies in a dance contest in a very sort of sexualized manner. And just to sort of add to the pop culture brew that's surrounding us right now, that we're swimming in, in this sexting crisis, um, To Catch a Predator, which was the most popular show on NBC for a number of years, which, which um, would lead you to believe that it, around every corner there is a child predator waiting to molest your children. So, so what's going on with all of this, um, this, this strange cultural moment? And I just want to sort of lay it out. Okay, so first of all, we have a dramatic expansion of child pornography law on a number of levels. First of all, wildly increasing um, prosecutions and law enforcement. The definition expanding and expanding. To, um, sentencing, something I didn't talk about, but sentencing for, for people who download child pornography has now sometimes actually gotten, people are going to jail for longer terms than, than some people who have actually molested children in real life. So the sentencing is out of control. Um, heightened media attention to catch a predator is one example. We're, we're very anxious about this, this crisis facing children. Okay, so this is coexisting with this endlessly rising epidemic of child pornography. It's a growing problem. And the increased sexualization of kids in pop culture. And the question I want to ask is, what's the relationship between these concurrent phenomena? And I want to begin with the obvious answer, which I think is primarily the right answer. The right answer is that the reason these are, these are happening concurrently is because the problem of child pornography actually is expanding. I really want to make it clear because I'm going to question it that next. But it, it, that's absolutely the case. And it has largely to do with changes in digital technology. It's pretty easy now to make child pornography and just disseminate it thanks to um, changes in, in technology. And as a result, there's just a lot more of this stuff out there. And that's the primary explanation for why we've got expanding law on the one hand and the problem keeps expanding on the other. But I want to suggest two other possibilities, not to, not to contest this primary account of why this is happening, but just to complicate our understanding of the relationship between censorship and um, desire and pop culture. And I want to do it by going back to a Calvin Klein ad. So this was a Calvin Klein um, jeans ad that came out in the summer of 1995. And it was on the sides of buses, it was on TV, and the ad looked like pictures taken by a pedophile for his lair. You know, and this was a picture from a TV ad. It was only on for about two weeks. 
Um, this, the voiceover from this ad made it unmistakable. The kid says, a, a, an off-camera voice says to the kid, how old are you? And the kid kind of deepens his voice and he says, I'm 18. And then the off-camera voice says, you have a really nice body. Why don't you take off your shirt and dance for me? I mean, this was like unbelievably bizarre stuff that was going on in this mainstream TV commercial. Okay, so what, what was going on? How did this happen? And, and just a little bit more information. This was called the most disturbing ad campaign in history. And it, what was interesting to me about it is it's not just the sexualization of kids, which we see a lot in culture, but the direct quotation of the language of child pornography. Calvin Klein was, or the photographer in this case, was trying to make it look like these kids were auditioning for a child porn film, okay? So the ads were pulled amidst public, tremendous public outcry. The FBI actually launched a child pornography investigation into Calvin Klein. But this is the interesting part. The ads were wildly successful in selling jeans to kids. The, the, the ads shot through the roof, uh, the sale of jeans shot through the roof. Two weeks on the air, and this was a major, major breakthrough for Calvin Klein jeans. Okay, so, and I want to think about how this happened. How did he know that this was going to sell jeans, and why would he do this weird thing at that time? And I went back and looked at what was happening in the summer of 1995, right before these ads appeared. So this was when, the summer of 1995, when um, the internet was first coming into our homes. You know, this is when everybody had an AOL account, and there were all of these anxieties that were circulating around um, child pornography rings on AOL. Um, Congress was legislating desperately, actually, in to, to, um, <laughs> to try to do something about this. Um, the Knox case had been decided. I'm just going to show you a picture from that summer. This is the cover of Time magazine. This is typical of the anxiety that was in the air um, at the time that Calvin Klein decided to do a child porn ad campaign. And I think what this suggests is that there's a dynamic of taboo and transgression that's particularly relevant for teen sexuality that censorship law should take account of. I'm not, I, I mean, I'll, I, I guess Jeff opened the door to it, to, to talking about Chaucer. So the wife of Bath said this, forbid us thing and that desire in we. That's the wife of Bath. And I think there is something to be said. I think it's particularly when you're dealing with trying to sell stuff to teens, that frisson of being the renegade, of violating the taboo in society, that desire that comes with the anxiety that we've targeted at child pornography might explain in part why this was so appealing and why Calvin Klein made such a brilliant and um, yet uh, bizarre <laughs> cam uh, ad campaign choice. And I'll just show you for the ad, uh, the ad campaign for Gossip Girl shows how relevant this is. This is th this TV show that's basically about uh, kids in high school, or was, now they're in college, kids in high school hooking up. And what did they do for their ad campaign? They used um, people condemning the show, every parent's nightmare, um, mind-blowingly inappropriate, the Parents' Television Council. This is how they sold the show to kids, right? This is, this is what made it popular. So it's that dynamic that I want to think about as sort of making, uh, complicating the question of how censorship works. A second Calvin Klein ad. Um, okay, 1999, Calvin Klein comes out with underwear for toddlers. This ad, to me, could not be more, I, I can't think of a word for it, cute. But it was so controversial that it was, taken, it was put up in Times Square and taken down overnight. It was, it, this never came out. A few, a, there were a few um, examples of the ad that got out before they could pull it from publishers. Why? Because everybody said, this is child pornography. And I thought to myself, how on earth could this picture or this picture be child pornography? And I went back and looked at what people were saying about these ads. Um, they were saying, you know, there's a, there's a focus on the boys' genitals. There's a focus, this is, a, this is an inappropriate focus on their genitals. And I thought about, and so I went back and I started to try to look at the pictures. I actually had a copy of the New York Times that they hadn't pulled it from in time. And I, I tried to sort of see what are people seeing in this picture. And I realized that in some ways what I was doing was engaging in the very exercise that child pornography law at its fringes 
as, as typified, for example, in the sexting cases, asks us to do, to scrutinize pictures of children and to say, how would a pedophile look at these pictures? How would, how would a pedophile see this? And that's literally what courts have asked us to do. They've literally said that in applying the DOS test, you have to ask, what would a pedophile see here? Um, you know, how would this look to a pedophile? And it's in this, this exercise of starting to run pictures through this test and think how they would appeal to pedophiles that I think has, in a funny way, inadvertently led to the sexualization of children, the very thing that child pornography law seeks to fight. Here's just an example of some language from an amicus brief filed to the Supreme Court um, in the Knox case, in which an amicus, um, uh, uh, amicus brief argued because lasciviousness should be examined in the context of pedophile voyeurs, this court should view visual images of young girls in playgrounds, schools, and swimming pools, as would a pedophile. And then the, the brief went on and said, these are highly eroticized um, sexual, uh, girls are highly eroticized sexual objects, and therefore if you view young girls in these settings, schools, playgrounds, swimming pools, um, you have to think about that as child pornography. So I'm going to end there with this suggestion that um, there may be perverse, unintended consequences as we fight what I think is nonetheless an important fight against the, sexual, the um, sexual abuse of children in child pornography. We have about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to open the floor for questions and wait for Jess Jesse to come by with the microphone. Hands? Do we see hands up? One down here. Hi, thank you. That was brilliant. Um, two quick questions. Can you talk a little bit about the context of Facebook, Amy? In your presentation just now, I was thinking about all my friends children who put photographs of themselves as um, teenagers or preteens on Facebook that are in swimsuits, bikinis, at the beach in the summertime. I mean, where does it end in terms of interpretation? And also, um, can someone comment on the recent Madigan decision to pull the sex um, ads off of Craigslist? Um. I don't know if this is on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, in terms of Facebook, there have been prosecutions. I, I can't remember if they were Facebook or MySpace. I think both of teens who've posted pictures that were pornographic looking. The thing that I'll say that's so weird is that if you begin to look, which I actually maybe ought to advise you not to, um, but if you begin to look at a lot of teens' Facebook pages, so many of them are sort of styled in a pornographic way, deliberately. The sort of, the, this language of, of pornography has become a common mode of self-presentation for teenagers. And I'll just say that it's certainly complicating our attempt to sort out child pornography from mainstream normal material. Um, all I know is that my daughter defriended me. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> But, but let me talk about the Craigslist ads. Those would be considered um, commercial speech, and commercial speech uh, proposing illegal transactions are categorically excluded from the First Amendment. So I don't think there'd be any First Amendment problem with the, the ban on, on those, to the extent they were proposing illegal transactions. Marty, can, given what you said about obscenity, I'd be curious to hear your view on child pornography. Uh, I, I believe that the Ferber case had a, 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 a rational, plausible grounding that there is a unique harm to the child who is participating in it. Not, uh, to take it to a child who's in a playground is uh, obviously an extreme that doesn't seem justified. But when a child participates in a pornographic uh, film or, or tape or something to that effect, there, uh, the harm isn't from the expression, the harm is directly to the child participating. To the extent we were talking about books or art uh, discussing um, child pornography, I'd say that's fully protected 
um, for the basic issues of anti-paternalism and anti-majoritarianism that I talked about before. I, I, want, to, I want to challenge this um, argument that the regulation of child pornography is as simple as people think it is once the court redefines the problem as protecting the child who is depicted in the um, image from the underlying child sexual abuse. So it's clear that you cannot commit the crime of child sexual abuse in order to make a movie or to make a film any more than you can speed on Lakeshore Drive in order to make a film about speeding. You can't just go do that. Um, or you can't burn out a house because you want to show a house burning down in a movie. Um, so it's quite clear you can punish the individual who abuses the child sexually, even though the purpose of doing so is to make an image or to make a, a, a movie. That's clear. Um, the state's argument, the, the court's argument, is that you can prohibit the exhibition of the film or the image in addition to punishing the individual who engages in the underlying child sexual abuse. And that's actually quite problematic under the First Amendment because we virtually never allow that to happen. So if, for example, I steal a camera to make a movie, I can be punished for stealing the camera, but the movie will not be banned. Or if Daniel Ellsberg steals the Pentagon Papers from the Department of Defense, he can be punished for stealing the papers, but the New York Times and the Washington Post can't be punished for publishing them. Um, or if I employ children who are underage in violation of child labor laws in making a movie, I could be punished for employing the children, but you can't ban the movie because the children were, because they violated the child labor laws. So the child, the, the child pornography doctrine, even as explained by the court, is quite problematic in terms of more general First Amendment principles, because the simple fact is we don't ban speech because there was an underlying illegal act. I understand that, and, that, and that's certainly a plausible position. The, the argument of the court is that it is appropriate to dry up the profits that the, the, uh, the industry is making. And uh, the examples you give are, are perfectly legitimate ones. I, th I think we have a, a commitment to the special protection of, of children, and that makes the court's decision not inevitable. I, I think it could have easily gone your way, but, but not implausible either. I, I would just add to um, add, add on to what Marty said that I think the court's decision last term in United States versus Stevens shows that they're going to limit this rationale to the area of children only because that was the idea of that case was basically or the legislation was we're going to ban um, violent videos or of animal abuse to sort of dry up the market for animal abuse. And the court said no. The, the analogy was to child pornography. And the court said, we don't do that in the First Amendment. And I think they should have said, we don't do that except with children, was, would have been a more accurate answer. But the court didn't deal with the, the situation where the animals were under 18 years of age. <laughs> I have a, uh, uh, sorry, I have a hypothetical situation that just occurred to me. Uh, suppose that I, suppose that someone publishes something that is admittedly obscene, but in the context, I mean, in the, in the course of the expression, the author advocates um, some illegal act, like a rape or a sex crime or something. Uh, does it deserve Brandenburg protection, or is it unprotected because, as a whole, it's obscene? If you stipulate that the speech is obscene, it's, it is, for that reason alone, unprotected by the First Amendment and can be punished regardless of anything else that's in the obscenity. Um, I also want to say a word about why I think we now focus on child pornography the way we did. We do. Before the 19, late, late 1970s, the concept of obscenity was pretty capacious. And most individuals did not have ready access to hardcore sexually explicit material. You know, you could maybe get it in a fraternity or something like that, but, but <laughs> for the most part, it was very difficult to get. Um, and in, in 1973, when the court redefined the obscenity doctrine, um, in the case that, that Marty talked about with Chief Justice Berger, um, it was doing so in a way to actually tighten up the definition of obscenity so states would have greater authority to ban even more sexually explicit expression. But what happened was that technology completely swamped the law. 
And so with the advent of um, VCR and then the advent of cable and then uh, the internet, the truth is it became completely impossible to enforce obscenity doctrine because we were swamped with so much of it, prosecutions just weren't going to do any good. And then what happened was exactly what those who were conservative in this realm were, con were concerned about. That is, they're concerned that if you see sexually explicit material, it will make you more open to more sexually explicit material. That is, your shock level will gradually d disappear. And so what's happened is that if you try to prosecute somebody today under the obscenity doctrine, it's virtually impossible to get a conviction because juries will say, well, that's not you know, patently offensive anymore. We see that on HBO. I mean, so it's hard to imagine anything being prosecuted any longer on obscenity. So what's happened is we had this category of obscenity that was like this, and now because of technology and because of eroding moral standards, to put it from that perspective, <laughs> obscenity is that. <laughs> and so what's happened is that revealed a whole lot of other problems that previously were just subsumed within the obscenity doctrine. And a good example of that is child pornography. In the past, what we now think of as child pornography would simply have been regarded as obscenity. And there was no need for a separate doctrine for child pornography. But as the obscenity doctrine shrunk down to almost nothing, you could not punish child pornography under that doctrine. And there was a need to create this new doctrine of child pornography. Could, could I just add one point? Uh, because your question raises the, the elephant in the room, the, the argument that obscenity regulation is justified uh, on the grounds that it objectifies women and encourages violence against women. Uh, I should emphasize that when you were talking about obscenity, we're not really talking about pornography in, in the, that sense. So that rationale is simultaneously over-inclusive and under-inclusive as a justification for obscenity regulation. Uh, you could have two married people deeply in love uh, explicitly having sexual intercourse, and that might be considered obscene, though there was no violence and no um, uh, objectification in any way. On the other hand, you could have a depiction of violence and torture of a woman that um, uh, hurts her within an inch of her life, but if her clothes aren't taken off, it, it's not obscenity. But the irony, the sad irony of that rationale is that it belies what is usually used as the justification for obscenity as an exception, that it contributes nothing to the marketplace of ideas. What that argument does is say, oh, it definitely contributes something to the marketplace of ideas, and it's something we don't like. But that's not a basis for, uh, for regulating speech. To the extent violence is advocated, you, you obviously were familiar with Brandenburg, and um, since you referenced it, I see no reason why the, the imminence requirement uh, shouldn't be applied here just the way it is for other kinds of criminal advocacy. Uh, what do you think about the current argument that the criminal justice system is making that obscene behavior can inevitably lead to more serious crime uh, and that that individual who engages in it will probably become a pedophile? There is indeed uh, a group of police women in Colorado who watch the internet, paid for apparently by the federal government to do so, and they, they are constantly watching the internet so that these evil things that you've referred to today uh, can be picked up, those people can be identified, and if they go on, to, uh, on the internet so often, uh, this leads them to uh, be, uh, have the opportunity to talk to a policewoman who will then try to get them to agree to meet her because she's really underage, that kind of thing. Or that they will uh, exhibit themselves while masturbating, for example, in which case the, the, the criminal justice system has determined, supported by the state legislature of Colorado, that uh, they are therefore going to commit a pedophilic crime and they must be prosecuted. Uh, before being prosecuted, they'll be subjected to um, uh, lie detector test. Thank you. So what do you think about this current state of affairs? I'm not. Amy? <laughs> no. Go ahead. What are you doing, Amy? I'm not, um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but I, I um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, 
But the argument that, I mean, one argument that that's people are trying to make around images, obscenity and child pornography is that it's going to change the way we think about children or it's going to change the way we think about women or it's going to change the way we think about marriage or change the way we think about sex. Um, those arguments ought to be and are sometimes recognized as unconstitutional under the First Amendment. That's, that's not a sufficient reason to ban speech because it's in fact the reason we ought to protect speech, which is it changes the way we think. Could I just add one point? I, I think there's an important distinction between someone on the one hand who pulls up sites that are obscene and on the other hand contacts somebody he thinks is an underage girl to meet her. I, I don't think we can equate those two. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Marty and Amy.